Hey friends, Peggy Hall back with you from the healthyamerican.org. The University of California wants everyone to become a human pincushion. I worked at the University of California. That was most of my career. Yes, I was an educator. I was the director of teacher education programs. I ran the ESL teacher training program and the professional development programs for K-12 teachers. Although I never taught in the K-12 in the United States, I did teach, let's see, freshman English and senior English in Morocco. And then I decided I didn't wanna teach um, adolescents. I wanted to teach adults. So the rest of my career was mainly in adult education. And I have been hearing from parents in California who want my help in helping their children go to college at the University of California without becoming a human pincushion. I've spoken about this on the channel many times, but I just wanna clarify because there was a new document that came out in 2024. I'm gonna share with you exactly which um, inoculations and jabs these students are supposed to get. And then I'm going to share with you this paragraph that I guess a lot of people are overlooking because parents are very concerned and confused about what they need to do to keep their children safe. Now, in many cases, these children are actually not children at all. They are adults, even though the parents are still paying for the college. But if they are 18 years old, then they would be the ones that sign the paperwork and make their own objection to these shots. I'm gonna break that down for you, simplify it, clarify it, share with you the pitfalls and whether or not you live in California, have a child that's going to college, I think this information will be helpful for you because it's likely that this kind of hogwash is going to be sloshed all over us again. And I wanna make sure that you understand these pitfalls and how to avoid them. I wanna thank the sponsor. I've been telling you about this collagen here, and that's at getnativepathcollagen.com slash Peggy. And you know that finding an honest doctor who isn't following in the footsteps of big pharma can feel impossible. And that's why millions of men and women are turning to this one Texas doctor and the seven reasons he says that anyone over the age of 50, like yours truly, I have a birthday coming right up, uh, should be drinking this one thing. And this drink is not milk and it's not another calcium rich protein drink, but it is a unique protein that naturally declines with age and is proven to significantly increase bone strength and soothe joint pain. It minimizes wrinkles and cellulite. It enhances hair follicle thickness and it can even reverse nail damage. Users are reporting results in as little as two weeks. And as a partner of the show, this Texas doctor is offering all of you, all of my healthy Americans, up to 45% off his bone, joint, and ligament restoring formula. You go to getnativepathcollagen.com slash Peggy. I'll have a link for you in the description box below. Listen, it is absolutely risk free. You try it, you don't like it, you get your money back. It's a 365 day money back guarantee. It has thousands of five-star reviews. There've been uh, millions of jars sold. So if you think it's something you want to check out, go to getnativepathcollagen.com slash Peggy and get your 45% off while supplies last. Friends, we're going to talk about these uh, sort of ridiculous requirements that have been published by the University of California. I worked at the UC, in the UC system for like over a decade. I'm trying to think about that. I did take in a, kind of an early retirement and I just could no longer put up with all of the liberal mindset. And I tried to help the teachers in the K-12 classrooms by creating lessons that were more student centered and were not just on this uh, kind of regimented help students pass the test so they could get the standardized test scores. And I really love teaching and I really love teaching teachers how to teach. It's something that is my, my gift and my passion. And that's what I spent most of my professional career doing. So I know this UC system very well. And later after I retired from the UC, actually it was very early retirement. I'll just say I resigned. Um, I went and I taught in the community colleges. I've taught in many different academic settings over my many decades of being an educator. And at the community college, 
I think I shared with you some of those stories in the early days of all the hog washing. Oh my gosh. I had been teaching there for a couple of years, teaching ESL. And I really love it. I loved all my ESL students, the people that were coming to the United States, wanting to improve their lives, to learn the language. Many of my students were working two jobs. They would go to work. They'd come to class from like six to nine at night. And then they would go work at another job. They wanted their children to have a better life. And I loved learning about the different cultures. We had an amazing time until everything was shut down in California and those classes dried up. They wanted me to teach online on Zoom, which I did. I completed that one semester. And then wouldn't you know it, they just stopped giving me contracts. Yes, I was a contract employee and, oh gosh, I guess we don't have any classes for you. I wonder if that had anything to do with that all out effort that some people in Orange County had to get me fired. I wasn't fired. In fact, I think I'm still on staff. I never uh, resigned. I probably have some sick time and vacation time coming to me. I should look into that. But both the college and the university are so, so liberal. And I remember telling my husband, look, if they ever require me to get jabbed, that is the bottom line. I am out of there. I'm never going to comply. And this was years before any of this hogwashing because they wanted me to get a TB test. And I was not going about to have the TB be injected into my body and then have a test to see if I had TB in my body. So I said, no, I'm not going to participate in that. What else have you got for me? And they said, well, we can do a non-invasive screening. We can do a risk screening. They asked me some questions and I passed with flying colors. So I have a video about that as well, how you don't have to be injected with TB and you can decline that and students can decline that as well. But it put me in mind that because they were always pushing the flu shots and everything like, oh, the free flu shot clinic today. And many people would just line up, roll up their sleeve because it was free. But the worst thing at the community college was one of the staff meetings where they wanted us to put on our syllabus, like my name, right? Like Mrs. Peggy Hall. And then I was supposed to put my pronouns. And I said to one of my um, co-teachers there, don't you think we should put our adjectives instead? I think adjectives are so much more interesting than pronouns, right? Adjectives describe you like, uh, you know, creative and inquisitive and hardworking. And I think adjectives are far more important. Well, we both got up and left that meeting and I never complied with that and I never will, but it was just run and it still is. It's very, very left-leaning and I just don't care for it at all. Uh, but the reason why I mention this is because I've been in the system and I know it very well. And I wanted to share with you and simplify for parents who are concerned about their children, these young adults that are going off to college, especially in California. I've done previous videos, but I just want to clarify. So what I'm going to do is actually read to you the email that came in. And so she said, hi, Peggy. This is a mom of a child going to school in California. I watched one of your religious exemption at the workplace videos, and it was wonderfully produced. The concern I have regarding religious exemption for the regular shots is unlike the cooties shots, which are experimental. And the regular ones have been around for a while and they're FDA approved. All right, before I go on with her email, a lot of you have been with me for a lot of years. What's the fatal flaw going on right now? Before I go any further, I want you to leave a comment and let me know if you can anticipate what I am going to say to this mom. So she's talking about the cooties jab, which is experimental, and all of the regular ones that have been around for so long. How can you have a religious exemption to these that have been around all along because they're FDA approved? Okay. Let me continue with her email. She says, unless I have solid medical evidence that these shots compromise the immune system, my son can't really claim that taking these is harming the temple of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, there is evidence that some of the cooties jabs were made with, uh, I just am going to say certain ingredients. Remember the video I did for you about YouTube? Yeah, I can't talk about the ingredients. Um, <laughs> about what they allow and don't allow. Uh, these were made with certain ingredients and 
these two reasons could be used to support the violation of one's religious beliefs, but we can't use these on the regular jabs. What religious grounds have been used to justify the regular jabs that they violate our Christian faith? Uh, you mentioned in the video that Kaiser has accommodations for the flu jabs. Was it a medical exemption? The UCs have medical exemptions, just not religious exemption. All right, let me clarify everything. And I have been doing this going on five years. It's super simple. I know that I've got hundreds, if not thousands of videos, and I realize not everybody wants to sit through all those videos. And I also have documents on my website, and I've got private consultations for people that are in kind of, they want my personal help. All right. So here's my free help and it's completely free and it's super simple. And let me tell you exactly what it is. This is the same strategy, whether it's for a job, whether you are applying and you have an interview, whether you are trying to get your immigration, your green card or your uh, citizenship if you're trying to get medical attention at a hospital or with your doctor, you have a right of not participating. You have a right to object. I don't wanna use the word no consent and I don't wanna use the word refuse because refuse carries with it an idea that you're not doing something that you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to do any of this. So you have a right to object to anything that violates your religious, ethical, or moral beliefs. Now, the ethical and moral beliefs fall under the category of a law, which is a civil rights law, and that is called religious. It's just your religious rights because your ethical and moral beliefs are a type of overarching guiding principle. And the law has recognized that these types of values and morals, which come from God, uh, but atheists have a right also, it's their religion and they have a right to refuse. Oh, they have a right to not participate as well. They have a right to uh, object based on their beliefs. Now, the issue is how do you present those beliefs? This mom is writing in and she's already talking about the science and the medicine and the ingredients. Those are not religious grounds. Now in the early, early, early days, I probably did say that standing in objection based on the ingredients was a slam dunk because if you, if you and your beliefs sit, state that you cannot participate in anything that had to do with abortion, it's a slam dunk. But then what are you going to do when they tell you, oh no, these were not derived using aborted cells. Oh, and by the way, we have a pill and we have a patch and we have a spray. So none of these are going to be injected. What do you do now? Well, I have the answer for you. And it's a very simple answer. And her question about, FDA approved and they've been around for a while and they can't harm the body. None of that matters when it comes to a religious belief. And what you need to do is actually pray about it. Pray for God to direct you in your God-given conscience and spirit and soul. And I believe that God has used this situation for many people to deepen their faith because they didn't really know how to express their objection. They knew that it was something that they didn't want to do. And that belief from their God-given conscience is the Holy Spirit, in my view, telling them not to participate. That right is protected even in the University of California. Now, the K-12, they are, and there are people that do get religious exemptions, but there is so much ignorance in the state of California, and it's so difficult to fight back. And my question is, why are you fighting so hard to put your child in prison when you could be using that same effort and energy? I'm talking about K-12 to create these superior learning alternatives. I did a two-part lengthy interview with my friend, Heather Martinson, who runs Celebration Education. And we helped answer all of the objections that parents have. So I'm not really focusing a lot of my time and attention to help parents uh, fight back against these 
you know, requirements in the K-12. I think there's a better use of their time and energy, certainly for the child. And when it comes to college, I don't really think college is the end all be all. However, you have a right to go to college if you want to, and you should not be denied that based on your religious belief, based on your civil rights. These are civil rights laws. It is not an issue of jabbed or pure blood. It's an issue of God told me not to do it and I have a right not to do it. So do not allow the conversation to drift into this area of FDA approval and they've been around a while and they're not going to be harmful to the body. None of that matters. What matters is God told me not to do it. In fact, the actual slam dunk is God objects to this practice. I, you want to take it up with God? He objects to me doing this to my body. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to prove that it's harmful. You don't have to prove that it's safe. You don't have to prove that it works or that it doesn't work. And for those who have already participated in this action in the past, if you've been a human pincushion, that's an easy one to answer as well. I've prayed about it and God told me to no longer do it. That's your answer. It doesn't matter about the approval. It doesn't matter whether they've been around. It doesn't matter what's in it. What matters is you prayed about it and God told you not to do it. Now, there are pitfalls that many people will accidentally fall into. It should be as easy as checking a box. My understanding is in the state of Florida, you check a box, you don't have to do anything else. And you shouldn't be required to... Uh, give them any paperwork or any affidavits or any statement of doctrine from a church. The church is not applying for the exemption. The individual is. And the law state that it's your, states that it's your individual sincerely held religious belief. It does not have to be consistent. It does not have to be logical. It doesn't even have to be agreeable to anyone. And they don't even have to understand it. The only thing you need to do, and that as a, I'm telling the mom, as a mom of the child, this young adult simply needs to state, God told me not to participate in any of these, period. No further explanation is needed. Now, the pitfalls is when you veer off into the science and these haven't been approved and all the side effects. None of that has to do with the religious belief. Now, you can get a medical exemption if you want. Let me share my screen. We're going to look exactly at what the University of California says. And this is as of 2024. I don't know. Am I the only person that digs? I guess I am. A lot of people, don't, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about this mom, but a lot of people don't bother to dig deeper. I think I'm the only one that does uh, uh, takes the time, or I'm one of the few that takes the time to dig. So let's take a look at this, shall we? This is from the University of California. And it has a paragraph called exception. This is 2024, exception. In the context of a mandate, you know how much I love that word. Yeah, two guys having a cup of coffee. Um, a mandate program, an exception is an approved. Now they don't call it an exemption, they call it an exception. Uh, actually, let me just, I gotta do a timeout here because I don't even like that word exception. And I'm going to explain why after we take a little break for our Tabby Tesoro. There he is taking his little cat nap. Yes. Tabby Tarzan, Belly Beans Tesoro. That's his full name. Uh, <laughs> it's such a joy here. Let me explain. An exception has a different meaning than the word exemption. The result is the same. So don't worry about it. The end result is that you're not going to get jabbed. All right. But the reason why I take exception with the word exception is because an exemption means it doesn't apply to you. You are exempt. All right. If you are in a wheelchair, you are exempt from taking the stairs. It doesn't apply to you. You just are not going to take the stairs because you're in a wheelchair. An exception means, well, you still have to do it, but we're going to just allow you not to participate. You may say, there you go again, Peggy, splitting hairs, cherry picking the language. And you know what? That's exactly what I'm doing. And that's exactly what you need to do. 
this is the hallmark of a critical thinker. You do cherry pick. You pick apart the language. You look at the words. You study the definitions. You ask questions. Why are they using the word exception instead of exemption? And I think it's dirty dealing in this case. Now, maybe I'm giving them too much credit. Maybe they're not as smart. <laughs> maybe they just don't even know the difference between the two words. But I believe that they're using the word exception because it gives them the power as though, well, we'll let it pass this time. You're not exempt. You still have to participate, but we're going to make this allowance for you not to. As I stated, the result is the same. You still are not going to be jabbed, but I don't like that word because the law uses the word exemption. Let's continue here, shall we? So here we have it. This is from the University of California, 2024. In the context of a mandate program, an exception is an approval issued by an authorized university official. I don't know who that would be. For a covered individual, meaning a student or someone who normally would be required to do this, to not receive an otherwise required jab. Depending on the situation, are you ready? Exceptions may be premised on medical exemption, disability, and or religious objection. I rest my case. There it is in black and white. Now, uh, it states that you have the right to a religious exemption. And I just shared with you exactly how to do that. Let's take a look at this document. Now, this comes from the California Department of Public Health. And this is what the California colleges, oops, colleges and universities are requiring. So let me share my screen. And these are the shots that if the young adults are not educated in terms of what they can do to avoid it, here's exactly what they would need to do. So the staff is not required. Isn't that interesting? just the students. How does that keep everybody safe, I ask? All right, so students are required to have the hepatitis B, the HPV, the human papilloma uh, virus, the measles, mumps, and rubella, the uh, meningitis, ACWY, oh, they come up with all these names, and the B, and the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and the chicken pox, and the cooties and the flu. So if that ain't a pin cushion program, I don't know what is. So luckily when I was teaching there, they didn't require that for the staff. They still don't. So think about it. <laughs> it justifies logic. Every student has to be a pin cushion, but the staff doesn't. It, it, even if you're going to buy into their narrative, how is that equitable and inclusive? I guess it's diverse. So it doesn't make sense. And then think about it. In the case, like in the K-12, where they removed the what they called a personal objection or a religious objection, and this is completely illegal, and there still are people fighting this, but think about it. So if someone seeks to be exempt on medical grounds and you're in class, let's say there's a class of uh, 25 people and let's say five of them have a medical exemption. So they're sitting there not jabbed and everybody else is. And then there's someone who has a religious belief and they are denied that. How does that even make sense? Do these diseases discern the difference between a medical exemption and a religious exemption? You see the logic isn't even there. That's why I'm speaking out about it. And I just want to say that I'm so grateful for this mom. And I'm so grateful that she wants to keep her son safe and that the son also wants to uh, not participate. So in terms of you've already had certain jabs, all you say is, I did that in the past, going future into the future, I'm not going to participate in any because God himself objects. And he told me so through prayer. You don't need to prove anything. It doesn't matter about any FDA or anything else. These are sincerely held religious beliefs, which are secured and guaranteed by law. There are plenty of people that have lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods because 
they were dealing with criminals who didn't know the law or they didn't know how to present the information. Sadly, they may have fallen into some traps and it's really should be a matter of just stating, no, I'm not going to participate. That's why I'm speaking out against it. I will continue to do so. Thank you, everybody, for being on board and uh, marching this with me all the way to heaven.